Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a mom of three kids, ages two, five, and seven, and I live in Southern California. And I'm Megan. I am the mom of five kids, ages six through 17, and I live in Michigan. This is the Mom Hour, part of the Life Listened Network. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 75 of the Mom Hour. I'm Megan Francis, here as always with Sarah Powers, and today we're going to be talking about something that's probably happening in a lot of households, and that is kids being sick and moms being sick and entire families going down with a bug. <laughs> And how yeah. we survive that and get on the other side. Um, I'm not feeling super great today myself. I know. We shared before we started recording that this seems like uh, a way to invite germs by by even talking about it on the podcast. I know. <laughs> At the start of cold and flu season. So, yeah, it's just a reality for for all of us. But we'll share kind of our experiences, our tips and strategies for making it through sick days. Um, but first, we have our sponsor back this week with us. Um, Mommy Nearest is a mobile app and a website, and they take the guesswork out of planning fun outings with your kids by providing location-based intel on family-friendly places to go and things to do right in your community. Um, the app is awesome. I've been using it. You can look up um, things around you, everything from which restaurants have high chairs near me, or if you're traveling to a city out of town, looking at places to go and things to do um, that kind of takes the guesswork out of it. So um, they have 10 major cities and metropolitan areas where they've got exclusive content specific to those areas, and you can sign up for their email newsletters, but the app is available to everybody all over the country. And there's, um, you can look up places near you no matter where you live. Um, and another cool feature is you can add in places in your town. So if you happen to know of a kid friendly, let's say it's like the local bounce house facility or whatever, and you don't see it, um, doesn't have any reviews or anything on their app, you can add it in yourself. So there's some great user, user provided, um, Intel in there. And it's a, it's a great service for parents. So an example of something I wish had been around since yes. when I was having young, young ones, but exactly. You may good for you up, moms. I know. Lucky you guys <laughs> pertinent to today's discussion. I just yeah. happened to look up urgent cares near me. I don't have any urgent needs right now, but that's the kind of thing you could use or 24 hour pharmacies or All right. any of these things that we need. Um, but yeah, the search features are just really easy to use and right down to the specifics of, you know, I need a pediatric dentist or I need a 24 hour pharmacy or I need birthday party location. So very awesome. cool stuff. So that's Mommy Nearest. Um, if you head to our website at themomhour.com and look for episode 75, we will link you up with them, or you can just search your app store if you're on um, iTunes or Android devices, search um, for the Mommy Nearest mobile app. Cool. All awesome. right. Should we talk sick? Let's talk sick. Hmm. Oh my gosh. So are you guys all healthy right now? Let's do a status. You no, know, I don't know. I feel like there's... So we're recording this um, during... The World Series week. Yeah. So my, I've been not been going to bed very early. Yeah. Um, and that I feel just really run down. So I, it could yeah. be that. I've had also that weird, like my voice feels like it's going and I can't tell. Oh, I also had this weird thing where my vision got all messed up for a day and I thought oh. something was wrong with my contacts. And it, I think it was sinus, like a oh. sinus pressure. Weird stuff. But I haven't really like come down with something. It's right. almost like you're waiting for it to happen yeah. and you know oh, yeah. it's just going to get you when you're down. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. The kids so far are healthy, knocking tons of wood right now. All um, the wood. All, all of, of the wood around wood. me. I'm just not. There's so much around me. I'm knocking it all. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so far so good. How about you guys? Yeah, we've had a pretty uneventful fall. And I have to say that's usually our pattern. I always kind of pat myself on the back because the fall tends to be uh, better than I expect with going back to school. We've had a couple colds, but nothing that's taken anybody down. I had Violet stay home last Wednesday. She woke up with a sore throat and I didn't, I kind of didn't know if it was going to get better or worse. She had slept with her window open. And so I thought, well, maybe it's just dry. Right. But then I kept her home and then she was bouncing off the walls. It did, it did turn into a little cold, but I, nothing has sidelined anybody. No, like coughing all night or fevers this fall. But I have to say like our pattern seems to be January, February. So it's like, yeah. we miraculously like seem better off than our friends and neighbors it, through that. And then I don't, I don't know why, or if it's just coincidence, but um, it seems like when we really, when it really hits us, it's like January, February. So I will yeah. also say the last couple of years we had those really, we had, um, where I hail from, 
kind of extreme temperature type winters. Mm-hmm. And those winters, the kids didn't seem to get sick as much. And I don't know, again, I'm knocking wood. I have no idea what's going to happen this year. I always wonder what what's going on like in the ecosystem, if it has some effect right. on the way things are spread or viruses living or I have no idea. It just yeah. was a weird little coincidence. So Well, and I've um, always kind of living in Arizona and California, I thought, well, these this quote unquote season, I'm, I'm not sure how that applies to us with our mild winters, but right. It does seem to. So actually, this is a really good time to give a disclaimer that we are not medical professionals. No, We're going to talk I'm about all kinds, of, <laughs> all kinds of things about like when we choose to call the doctor or when we keep our kids home from school. And you guys know us, you know, we're just two moms with eight kids and a lot of experience, but we're not medical professionals. So obviously take our advice as such. If you have a concern about your child, talk to your doctor and don't, don't put us in the position of having recommended medical advice. <laughs> or thinking that your kids won't get sick because it's cold or something. No, no, right. no, no, yeah. no. We don't know what we're talking about. Good disclaimer have... there, Sarah. Basically, we don't know what we're talking about, so don't listen to us. Let's go but on with the show. Sick kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's start with like, how do you know when you need to either call the doctor or, you know, head into the doctor? Like when for you personally, not like not not for everybody, but for you personally, what's kind of the point at which you think a kid is sick or sick enough that you need to do something about it. Either keep them home from school or call the doctor or maybe try a yeah. medicine. What's kind of that? What's that threshold? So here's one thing I will say. One problem I have had is that I am an eternal optimist when it comes to my kids' illnesses. And I've too often thought like, I'm just going to give it another hour. I'm going to give it another hour. And then we end up at urgent care or in the ER. Not, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time because my kids rarely really get that sick. So that's another reason why that's kind of happened a few times where I've thought, oh, this isn't going to get worse. I'll just keep an eye on it. And you might know, Sarah, that kids tend to get, they seem to get worse at night. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why they seem to also get worse on the weekend. That may just be because <laughs> like, I, I don't know why that happens. Maybe I'm paying closer attention or, yeah. you know, it's just been bad luck. We've had a, a few times of bad luck. In general, I will say that anytime there's a breathing issue, Mm-hmm. Um, that's a big red flag for me, which I didn't have at all with my, my oldest three kids never had breathing issues. Um, I think actually Isaac may have had a cold once that like went to his lungs. He had, um, pneumonia when he was like 11 months old. That was a total fluke. Never happened again. Um, but both Clara and Owen have had examples of wheezing and play- times when they just have really have had a hard time breathing. So that one for sure. And the other one would be like, if there's a fever that and I don't go by the number necessarily because I've had kids who are totally listless and miserable with relatively low fevers and kids who are fine with high fevers. Um, I go kind of by, is it sustained? Is it not responding to any medication? And I don't, I also don't medicate fevers right away unless the kid is like really uncomfortable or can't sleep or in pain. Um, then I'll medicate, but if it doesn't respond or if it's like spiking all over the place, um, or I, I feel like I can't get it under control or it's just been going on you know, too long right. than, than that. Otherwise yep. though, I don't really have like a hard and fast. I kind of tend to go by like, what is the kid telling me? If they, yeah. if they take, you know, if they get a little, um, ibuprofen and then they perk up and that's when they kind of want to start playing, then I think, okay, they're okay that, you know, I can yep. let this ride. And if that doesn't do anything, I, I really watch their, um, their demeanor more than anything. Yep. Yeah, no, I love all of those answers. The first thing that I thought of is, this is one way where we're so different. Um, when you first started talking about you're the uh, eternal optimist, I uh-huh. am like, I'm seeing doom. So like I get the first runny nose or I see the first runny nose and my mind has us like in the ER with pneumonia. I mean, I'm good at like checking myself with that, but yeah. I, I tend to sort of go forward and think, okay, well it's Wednesday. If this isn't better by Friday morning, I got to get in because I don't want to end yeah. up on the weekend. And it's, po- it's possible. I learned that just through the school of hard knocks. Allegra was such a healthy baby that I don't think she ever went to the doctor for anything other than a well visit till she was like one and a half. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and she was in daycare for part of that. Although that's when it, that's when it kind of started getting sicknesses and stuff. But I think I was kind of naive and I never really thought, well, I just didn't have a lot of experience taking sick babies to the doctor. And then Reed was the opposite. He was like the ear infection baby where we were. And there was like one too many urgent care or weekend times where I think it kind of scarred me. And it turned me into like, I've got to like, I've got to get ahead of this. Right. And so I think for a few years there, I actually probably took kids to the doctor, to the pediatrician before it was necessary because I'd, <laughs> I'd just been burned right. waiting and they were really little. And I was dealing with things like chronic ear infections or both Reed and Violet had 
you know, a couple bronchitis, a couple pneumonias, more chesty stuff, nothing that we were ever admitted to the hospital for, but definitely more prone to that stuff. So it's just funny that you say you're always the one that you think it's going to get better any minute. And I'm, I'm waiting for, I'm well, waiting it's funny. Cause two. when you, when you suggested this topic, I was like, Oh yeah, kids getting sick. I mean, I don't know. I just don't think about it until they're yeah. sick. And then I'm like, until they're really sick. And I'm like, Oh no, but that's been some of it's just been luck in the way it's kind of, sh- it's, shaken out with my kids. I've never, none of them ever had, um, more than maybe one ear infection each. Yeah. So it just, it's a little, you, you probably have been like, yeah, like a little scarred. I will say now I'm much more touchy about breathing things that didn't, yeah. you know, because we've gone through it now a few times, I'm, I'm a lot more proactive or a lot more like, Oh no, I hear a little rattle. I hear yeah. a little wheeze. What's that? You know, where your inhaler is like all that stuff. And, you know, yeah. so, um, that, that, I guess that stuff after you've kind of been conditioned a few times and didn't get it right, then you're a little more paranoid about it. Yeah. And you, yeah. you know, you learn, I think that's a good thing. We do learn from it, but I think it's good to be aware of too, when it's like, when it has become sort of, uh, like an anxiety trigger almost like, right. you know, that, that we can step back from that. I do. I like everything you said about fevers and, um, kind of watching how the kid is responding if they are taking Motrin or something. And also just walking, watching how that virus affects them. I think that's some, it's like the simplest advice, but just knowing your baby, knowing your kid. I also do want to say, I mean, our kids are older now, but the younger the baby, the sooner I think I would recommend yes, taking true. them in, that's you know, very with true. really, with really little babies, especially when it's your first, yeah. so much of what you and I are talking about. I don't even think we can quantify, right. There's no way. Like, yeah. The tribal knowledge that comes with mm-hmm. doing it over and over and over again, and kind of knowing where fevers go. The other thing I wanted to add about knowing kind of that threshold of knowing when to take action is if a kid gets better for a couple of days and then gets worse, I have learned, and I think a doctor even told me this usually oh, is like that a rebound or a secondary. it's like a rebound yeah. or a secondary infection. And that's what, like, that's what I would really notice. I think Reed and Violet, especially as babies would get the common cold, you know, and a mm-hmm. common cold, they always say like three days coming, three days with you, three days going. And that sounds like a long time, but if you think about a cold, you know, it does kind of come on slow and then you've got it for a couple of days and then it peters out and they would get the common cold and it would be the same symptoms as their little daycare or toddler buddies. And then they'd kind of like, it would either plateau or they'd start to get a little bit better. And then all of a sudden they'd have 103 degree fever. And that's usually when I knew ears, chest, you know? So I think that's, that was helpful to know. And I think every, uh, since I, since I have known that every time I've seen that happen, it has been something else is going on. And sometimes it's just another virus that kind of caught them while their immune system was down. But um, if they get better and then get worse, I, I almost always take them in. It's just like, yeah. let's just see, see what this is. Yeah. And, and the other thing I would say about, you know, really young babies, it's if, especially if it's your first that, you know, you don't have that knowledge yet, but also you just, no matter how number, what number of baby it is, you don't know your baby yet. I mean, yeah. if you've never seen the way they manifest a cold, um, it's sometimes babies can just seem calm and chill and they're really struggling. And if you don't really know how your baby does it, does right. sick, it's kind of hard to make that call. So if it was a young baby, I would totally agree with you and just, you know, and that's what, I mean, the doctors expect that even if yeah. it's just a phone call to, to describe to them what is going on and they can kind of reassure you or say when you should bring them back in. Yep. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, well on a kind of related note, when, how do we know when to stay home from school or daycare when, what about these kind of borderline cases where you're yeah. not quite sure. I mean, this is like a, this is probably a big topic, but maybe we can be brief on it. Cause with older kids, they can report their symptoms to you. They can also yes. game the system a little bit. And I, I struggle with the fact that mornings are kind of, our mornings start early and our school starts early and mornings yeah. are like kind of have a short window to assess yes. <laughs> what's going on. And they're kind of groggy and sleepy anyway. So I've over and over again, made the wrong call in either direction, sending a kid that, you know, really should have stayed home or keeping a kid home who was fine to go to school. So, so yeah, I've done that too. I think that that is totally, um, totally normal. It happens all the time. Yeah. Um, I think for me again, it's like the, not the obvious stuff like fever. They're, they're so stuffed up. They can't breathe or function. If they hurt a lot or they can't yeah. sit up, they're listless. I mean, those kinds of things are pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like morning can mask some of that stuff. Sometimes my kids just wake up and they didn't sleep well and they're grumpy yeah. or they have a headache or they don't think they think they don't feel well, but it's because their throat's dry, you know, yeah. something like that. So I actually have made the wrong call a bunch of times. And I will say I, re- I like reserve the right to 
reverse my call. I will call the school and tell them, you know, Clara or whoever is acting like they don't feel well. I can't really tell right now if that's true. I'm going to give it an hour. If they get better, I'll bring them in. And I've also called and said, you know, I've I, to the teacher, not the secretary. I call the secretary if it's if it's that, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. if it's the first. And if it's the other, I might just send the teacher an email and say, you know what? Um, like, There's nothing. I can't put my finger on it. Like, Clara seems fine. She doesn't have a fever, blah, blah, blah. But she said this morning she wasn't great. So if you feel like at any time she doesn't look well, just, right. you know, I will come get her. So yeah. I know that I'm in a privileged position to be able to do that because yeah. I have that flexibility. Um, actually, now having the radio job, it's a little bit less flexible. So yeah. I kind of have to make a call early and I kind of have to stick with it till at least like 10 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> um, that said, I I will gladly send the kid to school for a half day. I've done it a million, not a million mm-hmm. times, but I've done it before. And, you know, you can tell, they can tell. Yeah. Then sometimes the kid will get that sheepish look on their face and I'll say, you're bored, aren't you? You know, and they're like, yeah, I'm like, you're not really sick, are you? <laughs> no. Um, I've let kids have mental health days before. If it turns out by like, you know, 11, they're really not that sick, but they really look like they just want to stay home and they're still in their yeah. pajamas and they're all curled up with a book or whatever. That's fine. Yeah. I, I'm not going to necessarily then make them get dressed and go to school if it's just kind of like a, you know, please, mom, just let me see this through. But you can tell the difference. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think it's interesting. I think sometimes outward symptoms that look worse are actually less contagious and less, um, will bring them down less than sometimes like fatigue and achiness, which don't present. So I guess what I'm saying is when you talk about wake up in the morning, sore throats and coughs are usually worse in the morning because you've been sleeping all night or it's been dry or whatever. So I've had kids who like, if they're getting over a cold and I know the worst has passed, they, they might sound awful, but I know based on kind of the trajectory of the cold that they're on the up and up. And after that first hour of the day, when you've been upright and had some water to drink that you really feel pretty good. That's how colds are with me too. I kind of wake up feeling really gross and then it kind of clears out. So I do feel like sometimes I've sent a kid to school where I feel confident that they're no longer contagious and that their energy is going to be okay, but they do kind of sound terrible, or right? Look, yeah. You know, because it's that lingering cough or whatever. And then, like you were saying, like sometimes the fatigue or just you just can tell it's not right, and there's not maybe no outward symptoms. Um, yeah. The one, the one like rule that I really do stick to is uh, with stomach things. I really, do, I really try not to send them if they've vomited at all. Oh yeah, no, totally. In 24 hours, and sometimes that's hard because you know how fast kids bounce back from. Yeah from stomach things. And sometimes it's been a situation where we've all had it. So I kind of know, like, I kind of know what this stomach bug looks like. And I know that they're, they're probably on like on the mend and that they're, it's mostly over with, but I, you still kind of got to keep them home that last day if they vomited within 24 hours. Yeah, I agree. Um, I will say like the whole fever thing can be a little bit trickier because if, if you've been giving them medicine, you can't always tell. And sometimes it's like, you know, 24 hours, like the guy, they can't come back to school until it's been 24 hours since they had a fever without medicine, like without medication. But sometimes it's like really, that's can be really hard to gauge. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say I fudge that all the time, but if it's been like 22 hours, yep. <laughs> you yep. know, I, I might. Um, again, it's like watching the kid and seeing kind of where they are and, and knowing what that looked like. Not saying 22 hours since the last fever, but 22 yeah. hours since they yes. took the last dose. Yeah. I can't guarantee they wouldn't have maybe still had a bit of a fever had I not given them that, but you can kind of tell when kids are on the, on the rebound and coming yeah, back and like from that you stuff. Said, the, the afternoons and evenings tend to be worse for fevers, yeah. which we don't know why, cause we're not medical professionals. Right. Um, but I think that if they can make it through an afternoon and evening without a fever, I think that's like, it almost counts as 24 hours. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's like yeah, one yeah. cycle of the day and especially right. with that prime time for fevers. Yeah. Um, um what, and what about like, when your kids were in daycare, I know for a long time it was a thing where if your kid was sick, like if your kid was out sick, they couldn't come back until they'd been on antibiotics or something, which always annoyed me because I was like, well, they've, they've got a cold. They shouldn't be on antibiotics. Right. Anyway, and sometimes doctors won't even prescribe antibiotics to a kid with unless they have some kind of bacterial infection. So um, I always felt like that was really outdated and bad yeah, that, advice. And I don't know if that's a thing anymore. I haven't, I didn't hear that. We were in Arizona when Allegra was in daycare and then we've had preschools in both states. I've never heard that rule. I've heard mostly the 24 hours fever free, 24 hours, you know, vom- no, without vomiting. Um, I do know some schools want a doctor's note, I guess, to come back for certain things. Or I do remember, I feel like people would fudge the whole teething my kid is just uh, teething thing in daycare. Yeah. And that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little yeah. bit. What I know about teething is 
crankiness, drooling, irritability, and maybe a very low grade fever. But I think most doctors will tell you that teething babies don't have green snot coming out of their nose right. or yes. like hacking coughs. It's just, yeah, it, they could be tale. teething. Well, that baby could be teething as well yeah. as have a cold. <laughs> That's yeah. what I always think is funny. It's like, yeah, their baby, your baby's teething and your baby yeah. is sick. Yeah. <laughs> So. Yeah, because it's that age where they off, they almost always have colds and they're always teething. But right. um, so I do feel like our daycare maybe wanted doctor, like <laughs> maybe wanted doctor's notes for some of those. If the parents had been insisting that, you know, they're fine, they're just teething. And, but I don't ever remember seeing something requiring them to be on antibiotics. Yeah, that, um, that might be outdated now. I don't know if, if anyone out there listening is, if that's still a thing for you, definitely let us know because I'm curious. Yeah. And you, maybe we should talk real briefly about antibiotics because you've been more conservative on that, I think. Right. And is that been like, if you pediatrician recommend, like, how has that worked with you? Cause you don't um, have been on very many antibiotics. I, I don't think, I think maybe one of my kids has ever been on an antibiotic <laughs> like ever. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I didn't necessarily set out not to give them antibiotics. Um, I don't love the idea of them necessarily. I know they're overused. Um, not them not having a lot of ear infections helped because that's so yeah. often just like the the go to yeah. for ear infections and the one it's so funny the one time Owen got an ear infection we were in New York City he was four months old he got this terrible double ear infection and we called and our pediatrician was out of the country and his substitute would not prescribe us something over the phone and I was like listen I know I'm not one of those parents like I'm not yeah. I I'm do not overreact. I do not want to give this to him, but we are stuck. We're in this tiny hotel room. He's crying. We can't leave. It was awful. So it's yeah. just kind of ironic that the one time I was like literally yeah. begging a doctor on the phone Please. for antibiotics and I couldn't get any. And the rest of the time it would be kind of, I feel like it was always offered to me like, well, I could put them on some antibiotics if you want. And I'd say, well, do you think they need it? And they were like, no, probably not. So I don't know if I just wound up with doctors who were more conservative about that yeah. or if my kids just didn't have the kind of sicknesses that lent themselves to that. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously when Isaac was hospitalized with pneumonia, he was on antibiotics yeah. the whole time. Right. And Clara, when she was hospitalized um, in the NICU, was on antibiotics and I, because she had like a botched, they did two blood tests. Um, they did a blood test in the ER when she went in and then they did another one in the NICU when she was admitted. And the NICU one was fine and the one from the ER came back contaminated. They were basically like, we have to give them to her, but we don't even yeah. think she needs them. So Honestly, I mean, I could be wrong. Those are the only two examples I remember of any of my kids being on antibiotics, which is crazy, really. Yeah. I don't, but it wasn't – I guess I would have been more conservative about it. I didn't take my kids to to the doctor for every cold and cough, yeah. so that yeah. might have been why. Um, yeah. But it just didn't – wasn't really ever a thing. Yeah. I, I kind of have – my feelings have evolved on this quite a bit, and I actually feel pretty strongly that – my, that I've had pediatricians who just give you antibiotics to get you out the door. But I right. think it's taken me eight and a half years of motherhood and some sick babies and toddlers when I was at my wits end where it did get me out the door. It was right. like, okay, finally we have something tangible. You can do, you can but do something. Yeah. With hindsight 2020, number one, it was probably because I went through those years of taking proactively taking little read to the doctor. Cause I knew he had an ear infection or was about to get one. And so I think that's what they do. They give you antibiotics. So if I'd been a little bit more, if I'd waited a little bit, you know, um, but the bronchial stuff is, I would love if I've had a nurse or a pediatrician listening, I'd love someone to kind of settle this for me. Um, because pneumonia can be viral or bacteria as can a lot of infections and they can be secondary infections. And I understand that, but it seems like I get antibiotics, you know, offered for anything that sounds rattly in the chest. And, and that is, I feel like a couple of my kids have been on antibiotics for probably viral chest infections Absolutely. more often than they needed to. And that kind of bums me out a little bit. It's not like that doesn't keep me up at night, but if, you know, I think it's worth hearing for newer moms that just to either do your research or just find a doctor that you really trust. You yeah. Know, you know, I've yeah. always liked my doctors, but I think in the moment it's hard to, it's hard to turn down drugs if you yeah. think it's going to get you a, a, a night of not being up with a coughing baby all night. But I think I have a little more, I'm a little more removed now. And I feel a little bit more like that, that those drugs were very eagerly offered to me. And they're, and they can lead to a lot of issues. Um, yeah. you know, it's not good for your system to be necessarily on them if, if you don't need them. And it's, 
creates resistant bacteria and all that. So I'm, I'm like, you know, philosophically, I'm not opposed to antibiotics. I'm sure, right. I, I'm sure glad they exist. Yeah. Um, I'm also glad I didn't really have to choose, make that choice a whole lot. But yeah. also, I think I was just, I think I was a little more slow. Yeah. To get in the doctor's office anyway, because I had a feeling that what was going to end up happening was I was going to yeah. walk out with a prescription, and then, and once you walk out with a prescription, it's like, well, now I feel like if I don't take it, yeah, I'm doing something wrong. Whereas if yeah. I didn't get it, I know it's kind of crazy logic, but if I didn't get yeah. it in the first place, then I feel like I'm still just waiting it out. Yeah. And I, I would often find that if I just got to the point where I really wanted to take them in, but I just, as long as they were doing okay, they weren't, you know, they weren't having trouble breathing. They weren't super listless. If I just waited like one more night, it was almost yeah. always starting to resolve the next day. And my kids are all really healthy. So that's, yeah. I mean, I can't say it's because of that, but you know, it could be even when I or Owen, um, went to the ER with pneumonia, like last spring. Yeah. I remember that. I'm not even sure we walked out with the – I don't think we walked out with this um, antibiotic maybe, prescription. Maybe just albuterol. Maybe just – Yeah, we definitely had a buter- yeah. albuterol. And I'm pretty – they they swabbed him. And now – and, you know, they may have given him a dose or two in the ER just proactively. Right. But I want to say that they said, nope, it looks like it's just viral. And and I don't even think we got it, which is kind of crazy. So, I yeah. mean, I guess – and that's the ER. I mean, you'd think yeah. that they'd be all over it. Um or they may have said, you know, here, we'll write the script, but you don't need to fill it or something, which some, I think is always such a funny thing. Like, right. here, we'll pacify yeah. you. Take this script. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't actually have to do anything with it. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all over the place on that because I certainly wouldn't ever judge anybody else for using no, it not you know, or, or pursuing it, but it just was never really an issue for us. I yeah. Guess. It's funny. I think you and I are probably really, really aligned, but it's played out differently. And right. your kids have been on less antibiotics and mine have been on probably more than in retrospect, I feel comfortable with, and right. certainly not as many as some. I mean, I do know parents with really chronic ear infections where it's like all year long, practically. Yeah. And it's not like that. It's just, I, I do feel like every time we went in, especially, especially for the bronchial stuff, the bad coughs, which both Reed and Violet have had as toddlers, um, it always ended up in antibiotics. And I always just felt that kind of little bit of conflicted, like how, yeah. what is this really doing other than yeah. me? <laughs> well, and it's like, it's so hard to know, like looking at, I have friends whose kids, um, have a really hard time with drainage and are always snotty and, yeah. and ha- have been on like, um, kind of like prophylactic Benadryl mm-hmm. where it's yeah. just like a low dose of Benadryl just to kind of keep them dried up. That's something I think I would have had a really hard time with when my kids were three or four myself. Yeah. But then I'm thinking, well, maybe that keeps their airways clear and then they, it doesn't yeah. develop into an infection. They don't have to have antibiotics. So it's like, there's right. always this delicate yep. balance when, especially when you're talking about a chronic thing or something where your kid's going to need like maintenance meds. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. You know, that's such a personal thing. So I don't know. Yep. Yep. Find a doctor you really like. Um, and, and it listens lot, to and you. ask a lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. Ask a lot of questions. And like a doctor that listens to you and doesn't blow you off and make yep. you feel stupid for having a differing opinion or not being easily placated, I guess, right. would be the other thing. Right. So. Yeah. Agreed. Um, well, let's see. What about, we've kind of touched on, oh, did you say you have a funny ER story? We've kind oh, of yeah. Well, we, did, we, did we talk about, I guess we did talk about the ER. So I have a couple of funny ER stories. <laughs> One of my kids, who shall remain nameless, because this is kind of potentially embarrassing, um, and we haven't really we talked a lot about colds, but we haven't talked about other weird like ailments. Like, so this yeah. kid had a pain in his lower gro- like lower right groinal area, uh-huh. and I was convinced it was either appendix or hernia. Um, appendix problems run in John's family, okay. And my one of my siblings had a hernia as a young as a young boy. And so like, I'm tuned in immediately to that kind of thing. Right. Like, Oh, right. you know, here we go. And so we took him in and went through all these tests and he's crying and writhing in pain. And then he's like, hold on a second. And he went in the bathroom and took a really big poop <laughs> and then came out. It was like, all better. I mean, at this point he'd been at the ER for like four hours. Oh my gosh. So he just kind of walked out and was like, Oh, looks like that's taken care of. Uh, which cracks me. I mean, it's a great story now, but it's just one of those things where you just, right. you know, I remember my mom always saying if I had a stomach ache as a kid, like, did you poop? And yeah. I say that to my kids too, but, you know, they don't always want to tell me and <laughs> they don't expect that to cause that kind of pain. So right. there's that. Um, another another funny ER story I had was one time Owen uh, was in the bathtub. He had just gotten out of the bath and I looked at him. I'm like, oh my gosh, Owen, your, your lips are blue. Oh. And he was, you know, kind of looking all listless. And he's just got this very, like, kind of skinny, pale, peaked-looking face anyway. Yeah. So he can look really pathetic. And I thought he was having a hard time breathing. He had had a couple of weird breathing episodes around that right. time. 
So I just panicked and took him to the ER. Owen has been to the ER more than any of my other kids combined, <laughs> by the way. Um, something weird is always happening with him. But we took him in and by the time, you know, he was he was all blue for like an hour. And then by the time the doctor came in, uh, he was totally back to normal. And I'm starting to feel really sheepish, but like it's too late to take your kid and bolt, right? right? right. You've already gone through triage. They've We've checked in. He's got a, yeah. a band, everything. You got to get, um, we had to get, it, we were admitted, so we had to get released. And so the doctor came in and was just looking him over. And I said, finally, I go, Owen, was that bath you were, how long were you in the bathtub? And he's like, I don't know, like an hour and a half. And I was like, was the water cold? <laughs> and he said, yeah, it was pretty cold. And then I realized he'd just been sitting in cold bath water. And was freezing and turned his lips turned blue. But I mean, it just, I was putting it together really yeah. slowly. And then, yeah. So that was kind of embarrassing. I was just, and, and then of course, you know, that they were, they were great. They were like, you know, it's fine. Like, this is what we're here for. Don't feel, you know, don't feel silly. But then they had to do the whole thing, like the whole exam and shebang right. because he's already admitted. So they have to do it. I'm just sitting there the whole time shaking my head. By this point, it's like 11 o'clock at night. And I just felt like a big dummy. You live and learn. You, you live, live and, and learn. learn. And some kids just do weird stuff and you don't, you, you sometimes you just end up going to the ER and, or the urgent care of the doctor and it's something, yeah. you know, dumb and I, whatever. I That's like, what they're there for. Yeah. And I feel like I've gotten better about urgent care. Again, back in those ear infection days, I used to just want to get on top of it, whatever it was. Like if we're going to need to go on antibiotics, like let's just do it. And I would just, I felt like taking action like helped me in some way. And so we did do urgent care you know, in those years. But, um, I would say like, look at your local urgent cares or, and, and, you know, read the reviews or talk to people. I've just had really wide variety of urgent care experiences, including some pretty terrible ones here locally. Um, so now again, with a little bit more hindsight, I think I'd wait a little longer if it wasn't really necessary to go right in, look for pediatric urgent cares. They do exist some places. We had a good one for a while in Scottsdale that was really convenient. And that, you know, pediatric stuff, especially for little babies and toddlers, it matters. Like the tools that they have are the yeah. right size. The, you know, the training that the nurse practitioners get. I'd actually rather see a well-trained nurse practitioner sometimes than a crappy doctor. I hate to say that. No offense oh, to any absolute, MDs out absolutely. there, but I feel like we've had some terrible MDs in um, terrible bedside manner, really um, just poor choices in <laughs> in the medical doctors at some urgent care. So um, that's all. That's all I have to say is if you have the luxury of a few choices, if you have the luxury of waiting to see your normal provider, um, I've just, yeah, urgent care is sometimes more hassle than it's worth. And I'm not, I'm not saying if it's a true urgent matter, obviously take your child in. But if you have that ability to wait to see your own provider or to drive 10 minutes farther because there's a better, a better facility. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I am a huge fan of nurse practitioners. I don't really feel like we need to qualify that necessarily no, no. or apologize for it. Um, but not that saying you were, but, but also I think they have more time often yeah. because their, their schedule's not quite as bu- booked up. Right. And, you know, specialists and doctors aren't always, they don't always get into it because they love people. Let's just be honest. Right. I mean, that's sometimes you don't even really want them to love people. You just want them to love knowing how to fight off illness or whatever. Um, yeah. And I found nurse practitioners tend to be in it maybe for slightly different reasons. And yep. I've had really good experiences. And, and actually, um, one of the urgent cares here does have a nurse practitioner on staff, maybe two. Mm-hmm. And so does the ER here. And I found that really speeds things up. Like, because yeah. you don't, there's, the doctors are doing their thing. They don't have yeah. to be the first person to see you, but the first person that sees you still has some authority and yep. ability to do some stuff. So, absolutely, yeah, I think that's best of both worlds often. For something um, common, especially like a cold. Yeah. The, I, just to finish up on urgent cares, I, I finally, finally have arrived at where really the, the use of urgent care for me is for when I really know what's going on and I just need someone to. So strep, we've, we've had a <laughs> yeah. couple of times where I know it's strep because someone else in the family had it or like the kid next door had it and it's presenting and I could like without a medical d- degree practically guarantee that that's what it is. And I just need the swab and the prescription yeah. or whatever yeah. it is. So then I will go to an urgent care because it does help, especially for something like strep that's bad when it hits, but it responds pretty quickly or pink yes. eye, you know, the things where you're like, I know what this is. I need the drops and I, I'll go to anybody to get them. So yeah. 
other than that, I, I've sort of shied away from urgent cares in the yeah. last Yeah. Well, and, and it also depends. Like if it's a really good one and they open and you can get it right when they open. Yeah. It's often quicker to do that than it is to go try to get in with your, your own doctor. Yes, and absolutely. So um, I was going to ask you, have you have you been to any of like the minute clinics at CVS or Rite Aid or Walgreens? I think they uh, all only, have those now. Only for a flu shot. I've never gone for like diagnostic, but I, I do. I have wondered. Have you gone? Um, no, because the, you know, we live in a small town and the ones yeah. near us don't have them yet. Uh, we'd have to go like an hour and that's not worth it. We might as well just go someplace around here or go to the kid's yeah. doctor. Um, but I'm curious about it. I know they also do things like they do immunizations and stuff, not on little kids, but they'll, I think they do them on kids like ages seven or eight and up. So okay. if you're, if your kids need a shot for school and they're, you know, yeah. they do want to like go back to your doctor just for that one shot or something like that. Um, that's often a, a good choice. So yeah, I've gone myself yeah. for flu shot and for the, um, whooping cough, the pertussis vaccine when Violet yeah. was a baby, they wanted all adults getting it or maybe it was another year, but anyway. Um, so I've gone, um, but yeah, I, 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 I yeah, those are good. Yeah. Um, well let's shift a little bit too. I wanted to talk about kind of the, the boredom and stir craziness of having kids sick at home. And I am talking mostly about kind of little, little ones when you, you know, your, your time and energy is needed to just keep them happy and you've been cooped up inside and the weather's terrible and the cold just being, keeps being like passed from one person to the other. I think we've, We've all been there. Maybe it just helps to say we've all been there. Like yeah, no, the, we've all even, been there. Even a cold can just take down a yeah. house for a few yeah. days. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I wrote down a few little tips to share. First is a confession that usually when that first hits, I kind of like the first sick day because it feels like a we don't have snow days, but it feels like what yeah, I would it's imagine. Like, a holiday. <laughs> like I'm like okay, well nobody's going to school. Um, yeah. It's you know, I, I, you can watch TV, which we don't normally do. You know, it sort of feels like I actually usually get a lot done. If I'm not the one who's sick, my kids are watching TV. It's all cozy inside. And I'm kind of like puttering around cooking. Right. So, but what always happens is that's like at the beginning. And then by the end, I'm like, Oh, get us all out of the house. <laughs> yeah. So, um, a couple other things I wrote down is if you can arrange play dates for kids who are not sick or like farm your farm your healthy kids out on some kind of play date or activity or just, you know, because I think that's part of what is the stir craziness factor is if one kid is sick, then everybody's sort of housebound. Yeah. So anytime you can get creative with that, um, I I've taken friends up on offers to pick up stuff at the store, you know, if yeah. you're if mm -hmm. getting in, you know, taking kids and then also finding little errands when you're in that phase where you're not maybe bet nobody's bedridden, but you're still kind of germy. You can't go to the daycare. You can't go to the gym, finding errands where you feel like you're not spreading too many germs where the, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to think of an example, but you could go fill up the car with gas, right. You know, get out for a little bit. Drive through mm -hmm. like just, just to kind of break up that, break up that monotony. But, um, I think it's kind of like any other, any other time of life where you're, where you're overwhelmed is just sort of pace yourself, like keep the end in mind. Yeah. Uh, try not to binge on social media. I feel like I always, <laughs> I feel like by the end I've just stared at my phone for four days because there's nothing else to do. And I know I always end up like in the middle of my bed with a couple of kids tucked in around me and, you know, kind of like just having a cuddle. <laughs> yeah. I look at it as a good opportunity to, especially if I'm a little sick, but not totally sick to just yeah. not worry about doing housework or yeah. regular stuff and maybe just clean out my email box inbox or something mm -hmm. like that I never get around to. Um, right. that's a little bit low key that I can work on or I read like sometimes it's just like a good opportunity to just just kind of hit the reset button. So yeah. I like it too. I mean, I don't love being sick for a long time, but there is always that, you know, that first day when you're like, oh, I think maybe I'm coming down with something. Maybe I should just go to bed for the day. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, like it feels really good just to give yourself permission to do that. Or go to bed really early. Yeah, exactly. My style. Exactly. Um, what about, I mean, I know you and I both have had times where we're working outside the home. That obviously requires a little more juggling. Did you and John trade off during those times when you were working or have you had, I mean, sometimes it comes down to like, take, you know, mom taking a sick day to be with a kid, yeah. you know? Um, so that I mean, I'm, I'm, there's been definitely been days when one or both of us have had to cancel work stuff or like take a day off. Um, yeah. it doesn't happen too often. I mean, we've been pretty able to juggle it. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like I just, I'm thinking about that and I don't think it's been too big of an issue. But then again, that's because we didn't really ever have a traditional schedule. Right. Both of us at the same time never had a real traditional schedule. So I think that's one where having a backup 
like sitter or someone that you can call who whose health isn't compromised and who's you right. know okay being around um, being around sick kids. Just it would be good to have someone like that in your back pocket because yeah, it is, it is so stressful when you're thinking about covering childcare for kids who can't go to daycare or whatever. It's There's just... definitely been times when friends have come and sat with my kids or I've gone and sat with theirs, or even if mm-hmm. all of our kids are sick at the same time, we just kind of have yeah. like a little sick, like a pajama party sort of thing. Yep. So yeah, that can be really helpful too. Yeah. Having um, like that backup person is pretty crucial, especially if it, if you don't have the kind of job that you can regularly take time off and sometimes more, you know, several days in a row. Yeah. Which yeah. can be really tough. And I think just to finish up on this topic, I, th- I think one thing I realized is that the aftermath is it takes a while to kind of recover from a whole household hold being sick, even if yeah. it's just a cold or a cough and, and everybody's better, better within a week or so you get behind on stuff. And it's, that's one of the things that makes winter and this season kind of hard is because the viruses don't like come at convenient times. So no, if it knocks sure you down, you're dealing with the fallout. It's kind of like when we've talked about travel and, you yeah. know, going away, it's, it's like the adjustment back into catching up on work and on laundry and on grocery shopping takes longer than you think. So I, you know, knowing that maybe kind of yeah. factoring that in when you think about the, the run of these colds. Yeah. And, 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 and use paper plates if you have to, and yeah. <laughs> take your time, yeah. just little things can really add up. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, before we wrap, I was, I thought it'd be kind of fun to see if we have any, uh, like medicine cabinet things that have helped or that we always keep on hand, um, whether it's over the counter meds or products or anything like that. Um, I always have ibuprofen and Tylenol for little kids. I don't, I don't dole them out with every little fever. Like you said, I kind of like to wait to see how the kid responds to yeah. the fever, but it does. It's just, it reminds me of that time you said your kids are bread secure. Cause you never went, run out of bread. Yeah. Like I, I feel, I feel, I feel, um, ibuprofen secure if I have, um, and, and I have had babies who have really high fevers where you need to get something in them just to bring it down a little bit. Yeah. So I feel better having, um, and I also, this has come from doctors, but just in case some moms don't know that, alternate if they're not responding to one that you can alternate with the other ibuprofen Mm. and Tylenol. And again, ask your doctor what they recommend, but that's been a lifesaver for some really persistent fevers that we've had kind of going three hours alternating instead of having to wait four to six. So I always try to have both. Um, and I, I try to have Benadryl for, you know, allergic type stuff on hand. I have had times when there's been like mystery hives and no Benadryl and I've been running out. So I guess the things that try, I try to keep enough things that I don't have to do that emergency Walgreens run. Yeah. Um, and then one thing that really helped, um, with stuffed up babies and my babies were really stuffy even when they weren't sick. And I, I think I've probably mentioned this before is that nose Frida snot sucker thing. Yeah. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Um, so this, these came, became popular, I think when I had Violet, but you actually use like your own suction to pull the boogers out of your baby's nose, but the boogers never go into your mouth. It sounds disgusting. <laughs> thank you for, thank I, you for clarifying that. Yes, but you do. There is a straw like apparatus. Um, I, nothing ever worked better. The bulb suction that they give you in the hospital did not work as well. Nothing worked better than that nose Frida. So if you're not wise to the nose Frida, that get, thing was get hip. Amazing. Um, um, I'm, I probably have the same stuff. Saline, yeah. Uh, nose drops. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we have ibuprofen in just about every formulation (laughs) possible known to man. Um, I am paranoid about Tylenol. We have it. We always have like a little bottle of it. But the dosage with Tylenol is much more tricky and it's a lot easier for kids to get too much. Okay. And it can be quite toxic and terrible for their systems. So. Um, and there's always like suspension and children's and infants and drops and like all, I would always be like so paranoid that I'd be fumbling with it in the middle of the night and I'd pick the wrong one and give them the wrong dose. So I use that like only if I have to alternate, Yeah. but we all, we have ibuprofen and all these different formulas because I have kids who will only do chewables and I have kids who will only do grape flavored, you know, um, liquid. I have kids who will only do clear liquid. So we have a couple of those. And now, you know, the funny thing is most of our kids are graduating into adult meds because yeah. now if I give like William um, kids ibuprofen, I think I have to give him like six tablets or something ridiculous yeah. like that. So he's he's graduated onto the big ones. So is Owen, although I can never get Owen to take anything. Yeah, my like, kids he's do not forced. love 
taking. I'm, I haven't got, I've only had the tablets maybe once mm-hmm. and I feel, are they harder to find or am I just not looking? I'm just, no, to... I've never really thought they were hard to find. They're not okay. always kept with the liquids because sometimes they're, sometimes they're grouped by like babies and infants yes. stuff or like the liquids. And then they're like the children's stuff is like a, like a different shelf. Kind of depends where right. you're buying it from. Right. Um, I don't know. I think they're pretty readily, readily available, but, but even then you've got like the dissolve, the quick dissolve ones or the chewables yeah. or like, there's just all different. It's all Do you different have kinds. any tricks for getting kids to take medicine? That's, I, I'm surprised that didn't Threaten that you'll okay. take them to, back to the doctor and they'll get a bunch of shots. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm kidding. But there have been times I've been like, oh, and listen, dude, like if you don't take this, I, I I'm going to have to take you back in because I mean, you feel so bad. They're going to have to like do something for you. I, I mean, it's terrible, but yeah. I, I've in moments of weakness, I've. I may have said things that I regret, yeah. but he just wouldn't do it. I finally gave up because he would not for for years, just wouldn't. And it wasn't like he had to. I mean, yeah. we're talking about, you know, a pain reliever. If right. he wants to right. be in pain, I, you know, I, there's nothing much I can do if he absolutely refuses to take it. But um, I just would explain to him, like, you're going to feel so much better. And then yeah. finally, a couple of times he took it and did feel better. And then he, he kind of figured it out. So. Yeah. I think at both of my older kids, I, I have to, as much as I want to like, force it down their little throats. It has to be kind of on their terms and that it, it's such a battle of wills, but, um, I like, I've let them sip on that little tiny measuring cup for like half an hour. Yeah. (laughs) They'll just, they'll just take the tiniest sip. Like little, like, like like stick their tongue in it. Yeah. Yeah. But they, you know, they'll do it. And then or Allegra went back to liking the syringe. I mean, even as an older child, it was something about like squirting it and being able to take it all at once was easier yeah. for her than sipping from the cup. So I guess just, and then I have with the antibiotics before the doctors have said, you can mix a little Hershey's chocolate syrup with oh, it. Cause yeah. some of those antibiotics taste pretty nasty. And I let and my kids chase them with like a forbidden drink sometimes. Yes. Yes. Like Coke, uh, something they wouldn't that. be allowed to have. Yes, agreed. Yeah. That that helps for sure. Before um, we wrap up, can I share like a little a little story? Um, yeah. I have so I have a story about, and this is more about mom being sick than babies, but it's totally about just like listening to your instincts. Yeah. So when Claire was a baby, I had this weird thing. So you know, she was maybe two months old, way too young to have had a chickenpox vaccine yet, and I had this weird feeling in my inside of my arm, the arm that always held her. So like, it's just, it was the, I could never describe it to you. It was the most foreign feeling, but it felt like all the nerves in my arm, in my inner arm were like on fire or super raw, like, like a sunburn, but there was no sunburn. And so this went on for, you know, like a day, maybe not even a whole day. And I was like, this is just not right. I mean, my whole arm feels weird. She was little, so I was already run down and I did some Googling and I found out that it was a symptom of shingles, which is if you've had chicken pox, which most of us have, um, people our age have had it, um, it lies dormant in your spinal cord and it during, especially times of stress or low immunity can come back, but it comes back as like a super terribly painful rash, which by the way is super contagious. So I just, and I'm telling everyone around me, I'm like, I think I have shingles. I think I have shingles and everyone is just making fun of me. (laughs) So like that's an old person thing or you don't have shingles. You're crazy. I don't see anything on your arm. And so the thing is with shingles, if you take antivirals, that it'll like make it not as contagious or not contagious, but you have to get it before you see any source. So you have to get okay. it before anything comes out, like any bumps right. or whatever. And so I finally called, I think I even called my doctor and they didn't, like my woman doctor didn't get back to me. And so I called Clara's pediatrician and I explained it. I was like, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm pretty sure I have shingles. Like, is there anything I can do? And he prescribed me an antiviral and I took the antiviral for two days. And on the second day, a huge sore popped out of my <gasps> arm. So I was oh. totally right. And that was it. That was the only sore I got. I covered it with a band aid, um, and it went away. But had I not got on the meds, it could have been terrible. And yeah. poor Clara's like bald little head and neck would, cause I was holding her constantly. Yeah. That was my nursing yeah. arm would have been rubbing around on my shingly arm for days. <laughs> oh my God. So I just think about that. I'm like, just, I am so glad I believed myself and listened mm-hmm. to myself and knew something was wrong. I'd never felt that sensation before I did, I knew it wasn't normal. And, mm-hmm. you know, I kind of used Dr. Google, which I know you're not really supposed to do, but it seemed pretty straightforward. It's not like I diagnosed myself with cancer. Right. Um, but it was, it was like my mom instincts were really what yeah. was kicking in. I didn't care so much yeah. about myself. It was like, I don't yeah. want my tiny little baby yeah. to have chicken pox head. Yeah. So there you go. Wow. No. And yeah. I, I, I think when we say you're not supposed to Google things, I, I think there's a big difference between just accepting everything that the internet says and doing an informed right. search. Um, I've, you know, I've gotten actually 
comfort or information from reputable reputable googling so yeah but yeah can kind of send you down a rabbit hole sometimes it can too. it can but so. in this case it was like oh it just kind of confirmed what I kind of I had heard about people having shingles and I was like maybe this is shingles that would be weird wouldn't it and then it turned out that's totally what it was it felt very validating as well I got to yeah. go around to all the people who said I didn't have shingles and like show them my huge like pox and it's gross I mean it's like <laughs> shingles are, are pretty nasty but I was like look at look at look at my sore on my arm I was right <laughs> I was right <laughs> Oh, so. my gosh. Well, now that we've recorded this show, our families will promptly get hit by the plague. I hope so. not mine because we're going to Florida next week. So let's okay. just keep it. You know, maybe we can when we get back. Knock on all of the wood again. All of the wood. Um, so just a reminder to check out Mommy Nearest, our sponsor, by looking in the App Store, your, wherever you get your mobile apps, or going to mommynearest.com. And then head to the momhour.com, look for episode 75. We mentioned a few products toward the end here. I'll definitely link to the nose Frida if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and anything else we think of on this topic, I will link to. So you can get all of that at the momhour.com. Just look for episode 75. Anything else from your end, Megan? Nope, I think I'm good. <laughs> <coughs> all right. I feel like my everyone. nose is getting stuffy. All right, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>